I don't believe it. We finally made it. Issues 79 and 80. The last two issues of Stormbringer magazine. Collected, assembled, and painted. The final miniature, the Swamp Boss Scumdreck. Let's have a look. Hello and welcome to The Lucky Roll, an eclectic channel for eclectic games. And today we're going to be looking at the final two issues and the final episode of our Hatchet Collection Stormbringer magazine. Now in this episode we'll be looking at issues 79 and 80 which come with the uh, Swamp Boss Scumdreck, the final model in the series. But not only that, we're going to have a quick look over every model in the series. Now you can see here on the table there's about a year and a half's worth of collecting and painting and um, I have to say looking at this collection I am quite pleased at what I now have and the little journey I've been able to share with you all over the past year and a half. I'll probably pick one or two of my favorite models and um, one or two of little moments or incidents that uh, helped me improve both as a, a painter and as a gamer but before I go into that for old times sake we have to have a quick look about the magazine and the mini that comes with the magazines before we move on. So looking at issue 79, the second last issue, we have the finishing of the stories of The Gathering, so it's the finale. Um, there's again four pages worth of story there. We have a new little synopsis again on the Iron Jaws, just giving you some more little information on the leaders and what they're like. Um, different aspects of creatures that would answer the wog, such as the Gargants, which is one of the ones we have over there. Different heroes, ranged troops, beasts, and of course the standard old infantry. We have here the Swamp Boss Scumdreck, which is the model that comes part one in this magazine. Um, we have some more details on it, and you have of course the How to Build Guide. Now the How to Build Guide is, uh, there's enough, there's a bit to it. It's a nice big model, a lovely one to finish the entire collection with. So there's about five pages of instructions. So it is also something I'd urge you to build slowly and with sub-assembly because there's there's quite an awful lot of little bits to it. Um, you have here the Storm Drake Guard, which were the two beautiful models that came with the previous three issues. Uh, basically how to use them in the Strike Force. And you have a battle plan called The Last Stand, Stand Forth, in which you can use these models. And of course here, the little teaser for what is the final issue here in front of me. So again, it's, um, it's a bit of the end of an era. It's nice to see the end of it, but also sad to see the end of it. You have a nice little kind of goodbye here from Ian, the editor. So thank you, Ian, for all your hard work in the last year and a half of this wonderful magazine. Um, you have The Last Stand, which is another story here, which is quite a, an in-depth one. Um, there's a nice bit to it, so it's kind of, it touches on everything. Um, you have here the How to Paint guide. So naturally enough, you had the How to Build the Swamp Boss Scumdrick. Now you have the How to Paint, and there is still some nice advanced techniques in here. So if you're using only the paints in the actual collection itself, you will still come up with a model that has um, nice little bits of detail. You have here a full page of um, the Swamp Boss Scumdreck and uh, what he's capable of. So he has a lot of different things that you can kind of um, do to hurt your enemies, such as the Thrashing Tail and Nice and Boyce, Grapping Talons. Um, you have here some little tutorials on how to use it. The Cunning Crew, which you can use with it. And the Swamp Boss Scumdreck, which is used in the last stand the storm breaks so you have the alliance of order and the alliance of destruction with all the models that you have collected up to this point and a final synopsis for the victory and what i liked here as well was the rise of the horned rat which is a nice little teaser for the latest edition of um, the mortal realms which focuses on the skaven now with that said this is the actual model itself and um i have to say it was a lovely one to work on. Uh, there's a lot of really cool little details. So of course you have the Oruk here with his metallic glove. Um, you have the kind of the nice little grabber. You have a couple of cages here for the actual uh, Scumdrick. But the beast itself was essentially great to work with and great to paint. The main paint they used, would you believe it, was uh, Death Guard Green. And because the model is so wonderfully detailed, all you needed to do was put a little bit of a wash and it did the bulk of the actual skin for you. 
The tail as well was uh, nice, was just a little bit of Rhinox hide, and because it's kind of dragging it along the ground, it'd be kind of a, a dirty manky tail. You have um, the toes, you have the claws, you have a great fantastic little model here. I mean, it's something that is really kind of top, top tier detail in every little aspect of it. And you can kind of see that like here with a little kind of um, a rope attached, making sure that the, uh, the little frame that the Oruk on the top is sitting on top of is uh, kind of covered and makes kind of physical sense. Um, again, you've got chains here, you've got the two cages, three cages, excuse me, another one down here, and uh, an awful lot of little kind of belts and chains and things like that. So it's, it's a beautiful little model that just stands out and I think is a lovely way to kind of complete the collection with. And of course, it would complement quite nicely with the other model here so that you have two kind of hideous creatures crawling across the battlefield. So again, it's obviously the bigger one and it's kind of the, the prize in the collection for the um, Alliance of Destruction models. But nevertheless, a lovely one to finish with. And um, at this stage, you would be quite good, I think, at painting and building. So any challenges it would pose is not something that would really kind of get you. But as for the rest of the collection itself, there are quite a few highlights here. There was great variety. I mean, you have the Sylvaneth here, you have the Stormcast, you have um, the Dwarves over here, you have the Iron Jaws, you have the Goblins, you have more Iron Jaws, you have the Oruks, uh, you have the Gargant at the end, and you have the Goblins, and you have the Hobgrats, and you have some really cool little pieces of terrain. So again, I actually have to zoom really out because there's so much stuff here that it's hard to kind of get it all in. So I'm just going to zoom in and I think I'm going to pick out a couple of the little pieces that I enjoyed making and building. Um, obviously this was one of the earlier ones that came in a nice early issue and again, you know, it was a nice kind of impressive piece to get early on in the magazine series. But uh, again, it would kind of suit very well with the Swamp Boss Scumdreck here so that you have two kind of horrible lumbering beasts coming across. However, it's not just the forces of destruction that have lumbering beasts. I, this is one of my favorite models in the collection. I would never have painted uh, or collected Sylvaneth if it wasn't for this series, but um, I got to put a lot of work in the uh, tree monster. And I had forgotten, looking at it now, it's, it's, I'm very happy with how the paint scheme came out, but also, it's a model that was so very well designed that it lends itself to a paint scheme. I mean, uh, the minis work best when they kind of facilitate an average painter and make them look a little bit better than they are. And I like to think that this model uh, helps me look better, look like a better painter than I actually am because it was kind of, it was layered. The face especially was kind of in different aspects that you would build on top of it. So if you sub-assemblied the heads you could kind of get the mouth and the eyes and things like that, and then put the actual face mask on top of it. The same thing here with um, the kind of the, the hint of magic in the chest and the runes in the legs and things like that, that um, it was deep enough that you could actually get your orange and red brush in there and then paint over again with a little bit of Rhinox hide and dryer bark to kind of get a nice kind of glowing wooden effect in there. It wasn't a huge aspect of skill on my part, it was just you know, the model being very well designed and being fun to work with. Um, again, this is one of my favorite models. Another one I see here now that I actually quite liked was the uh, the Broken Fountain. I really like this series because I would never pick up terrain. I'd always be picking up the kind of latest, coolest, scariest looking model. But you forget that terrain play is a huge part in these games as well. Huge in the sense that sometimes it's part of the rules, but also they just make the table look great. And this little fountain, as humble as it is, has been a great centerpiece for some of the battles that we've played in it. Um, it was just a very simple kind of, there's only two or three paints here, but all it needed was a quick little wash and I got to have uh, a lovely little centerpiece that I was quite happy with how it turned out and how it looks. Um, other cool little terrain pieces would be this skull here. I just like this as well, that it's a kind of a a fallen dragon from a previous era uh, with a kind of a whole aspect of giant's causeway type of um, rocks and things here. It really kind of helps with the realm of fantasy. But um, <coughs> again, the same thing here with the, the kind of the, the Sigmar border guards here that 
they were great for kind of even even for the few games we've played that we have used this is kind of the uh, the bordering for um, certain models or armies that uh, everything behind this line is uh, basically the deployment zone for the models um, again quite quite a simple model to make but it came out very quickly looked very well and I was quite happy with it another one now again would be this terrain piece here I love the idea that you're constantly like in the lore they're constantly trying to conquer and establish the mortal realms they're trying to take it back so of course they're building um, houses and uh, kind of fortresses and all sorts of things here so you can see here with the kind of the level of construction that's going on that Sigmar is making a genuine effort to take all of the mortal realms back and that they're constantly trying to push the forces of darkness back that more. Now what was really cool about this is that this is a great little terrain piece, but you also got two of them. So the other one is way over there in the corner, so I won't reach out to get it because it is essentially the same thing. It was a little tedious doing it twice in a row, but nevertheless worth the effort because um, it serves as a great little base, one for either side of the army. Um, another model here that I quite like was this one. Um, I totally underestimated this model until uh, I used it in battle. This thing is a beast. The range on this monster, is, or this model, is huge. And uh, it was nearly as good a siege weapon as any other uh, siege weapon that my uh, enemy players were bringing to bear with me. And he also comes with two little griffhounds. So, um, again, you, you don't realize sometimes what little treasures you have with some of these models. Now, I think this guy's units have all been kind of uh, taken out. I think he was the captain of a specific type of um, archer that was part of the Stormcast Eternals that have been recast and kind of uh, dumped, unfortunately, for the latest iteration. But uh, I'm not so sure about the leader, whether he still works as a kind of a unique model or not. I'll have to get the, the War Scroll when it comes out to see if he's still in it or is it... Yeah, see he, um, to see if he's still in it, but uh, this model, I was not prepared for how powerful it was on the battlefield. Um, another kind of personal model uh, is this one. Um, again, this is going to be a bit cringe, but uh, this essentially was, uh, this is my wife, Anne-Marie. Uh, wanted to paint her into one of the models and this was the unique model that came with this collection so the original leader was a brunette but of course I had to make her a blonde uh, like Anne-Marie and uh, I told Anne-Marie and she was uh, half impressed half kind of thinking okay Sean why couldn't you make it a, a nice kind of fairy figure or you know something magical rather than kind of a, a lady with a big kind of halibur that just kind of clocks the heads off fellas but uh, nevertheless, she appreciated the sentiment. But this is a kind of a, a special model for me because A, it's a unique one that's unique to the collection, but also B, that, uh, you know, I was painting the love of my life and uh, just had fun putting her down as a leader in a battlefield. And of course, she's always the, uh, <laughs> she always survives no matter what happens. Um, this, of course, is the leader of the Stormcast Eternals. And I thought this was a great model to get, a really impressive one. I mean, um, Age of Sigmar has some beautiful creativity in its models and I remember having great fun with this, especially this little thing. I did not expect the skull thing to kind of look as cool as it does, but it's just a nice little touch. There's so much kind of creativity on these characters and, you know, that there's so much lore that I'm looking forward to the development of the game over the next few iterations and next few um, in the future, but that, uh, again, as the leader of the Stormcast Eternals, he just looks cool and is an absolute beast as well. But again, the Stormcast Eternals are a very fun army. But unfortunately, a lot of them have been kind of taken away. Not all of them now, but uh, some of the models here, I think, like this one, are no longer in the new edition. So they will age a little bit. But nevertheless, it's been nice to actually get them before they're gone and paint them and have them in my collection. Because I don't just play with my models, I like to kind of display them as well. Um, some of the bad guys, like this guy now, was part of the um, <coughs> the uh, Shadespire game, I believe, the, the, the Warhammer Underrealms game, that he is one of the, uh, the gangs or monsters, but 
it was cool to kind of get him in this guise and to kind of, you know, get uh, rules for him in the main game and just get to play him here because it's it's not something you would normally pick up unless you were actually playing those um, Underworld games. But uh, to actually have him here, <clears throat> part of my actual uh, Forces of Destruction army, was cool. I had great fun with it because I was using different aspects of um, light contrast and even here in the back, I don't know if the camera can pick it up, but there's slight little shade and uh, hints of purple. I think he's called Moloch and he was one of my favorite kind of models to make because it just, I got to experiment with him and I realized it was, some, it was a model I was never probably going to pick up except for this magazine. But a, a really cool looking monster, you know, kind of with his lunch here in one corner, um, his tenderizer here, a load of mushrooms just growing up off the top of his head and a big huge hunchback which is all muscle for the character. So, you know, that there's been some great creative models that you got to kind of have and play in here. Another really interesting one, of course, is the King of the Squig Riders. Now, I remember Tony loving the idea of these guys and in the new um, Spearhead game that we we're looking forward to kind of using the goblins in uh, and his different iterations in it but again the amount of fun you can have with the squigs and the goblins and things like that are just great i mean this guy is the king of them all but the whole idea and the whole concept of uh, a little goblin basically clambering onto a thing that's just 90 percent teeth and stomach is just um, fun and amusing and has been great fun to paint because there has been some great creativity especially with the goblins and that it's they're they're so mad and zany that uh, you have all sorts of kind of things like this guy now literally hopping up into the air. I know that he's using a bit of cloud of smoke to just get that little bit of extra height. But when these things are on the tabletop, they just look epic. So I'm just going to take out some of the actual Stormcast here just so you can focus a little bit better on him. But uh, these have been just brilliant little models. You know, that they're just fun. That uh, there's a little creativity. I mean, like... This is the guy who's, this is the height of the fella that he's supposed to be at. And that's the one that the guy is literally jumping above him up high. And they've just, of course, taking the actual lance to make it that little bit higher. So it's kind of like, uh, I suppose, a short guy overcompensating a little bit. But the squig riders now were a very fun part of the collection and something I did quite enjoy making a lot. Now, there were one or two little models that I do regret. Um, this one... I wish I could have done a better job on it, but uh, nevertheless, it was still a learning experience. Um, I was trying to learn how to kind of blend and work with um, both contrast paints and deep paints, but uh, I didn't do as good a job on this as I like. But nevertheless, it's good to see kind of past mistakes and where he went wrong and where he could possibly go right again in the future. Um, I don't know if I'd ever actually get this model again because there was an awful lot of work in it and I put a lot of work into it but uh, it did end up breaking my heart a little bit, and especially the Cadian flesh tone for the face of the rider, I was never really happy with, and the actual haunch here of the beast itself, trying to go from a, a gradual purple to light, just didn't quite work. However, you can see here some of the Griff Charger gray paint, which did a great job here on the actual, the monster, and you can see it in a better aspect with the Storm Drakes which um, was only in the last particular episode, but um, I was really impressed with how the Griff Charger Grey helped uh, bring out the scales of these types of models. And of course, the Drakes are definitely uh, a kind of a, a keystone of the collection, that they're just gorgeous looking models and that they, they, they really kind of command the space. I mean, they're literally heads and shoulders above everything else. As you can see here, when I put this fella into his base, that it just, it stands out. It's a huge, gorgeous, effective little model and just kind of takes over the entire space. Something that the enemy often targets first. Now that's not to take away from the uh, Oruks themselves. These guys were uh, a kind of a, a remaking of the standard Orcs. The Orcs were kind of the iron jaws here you can see are just kind of you know your standard orcs there's nothing wrong with them i mean the um they do look well uh i much prefer the ard boys to the rest of the orcs and what was really cool about these ard boys actually is they came with uh, two different variations so you have the spear and shield here but you also have the sword and shield with the ard boys so if you did pick up two issues of that particular magazine 
that you would have uh, quite a lot of them. But this is the more the modern iteration of them, and I much prefer it. It's a bit more Lord of the Rings. They're called Oruks, and they're more swamp denizens, but they're they're just kind of scarier and nastier and much better looking, you know? I mean, the realistic is, uh, it's not the wrong word, and it's not the right word, but it's not, it's not a totally inappropriate word either, that they're a bit more realistic monsters when they're given what they're coming up and facing, and that the shields here, I mean, these guys like that would reflect this guy's shield, of course, has the eye patch for the actual model itself. You have here the uh, little hobgrats, which were um, initially fun to paint, but you had so many of them that you kind of started to get sick of painting them a little bit. But again, you know, much more realistic, much more kind of nasty, and uh, not as much fun as the goblins, but uh, still akin to them then that they're small, kind of nifty, terrifying little things that can kind of go off and do a lot of damage. Um, there was also other cool things such as the um, the Hunter Killer Bow, which again brings or Oruk ingenuity to the to bear in the sense that you can see that there was incredible detail here. I mean like you you can see now that there's little Gretchens or goblins here whoops uh, laboring and lumbering with huge kind of um, scabbard with all the actual ammunition in it. Uh, you have one guy here holding it up, the other fella literally sticking his face in your man, or sticking his foot in the other guy's head to kind of pull out the next piece of ammo. You have the actual Oruk shooter here and you have the guy here whose job is to reload it and kind of wind it back. So again, you know, the, the fact that there was kind of a slight style change allowed the Oruks to become that little bit better and cooler. Um, another one that I'd like to show is the Ail Guzzler Gargant, which was fun to paint. Um, <coughs> there was an awful lot of kind of variety with this one because I opted to go for Jorgen, which is kind of a, a famous character from Warhammer Fantasy, in that he's forever running away from things. I think he's the most unlucky guy in the world. And that in this case, he just happens to be running away from what looks like a huge uh, giant with a big beer gut ready to put him into uh, a little cage who, of course, being a, an ale guzzler, he has to have a bottle of ale. There was some great kind of extra bits that you could get with this. I mean, there was a multitude of weapons. Now, this weapon I thought was class because it was like four weapons in one uh, in a tree trunk. But also, you could kind of... Um, you could come... He came with... Uh, other kind of additives like say that you could have a bag full of people who were already captured you could have a cow that was probably the guy's lunch in a bag that um, there was an awful lot of cool little things you could attach to it so again this is one of the issues that if you bought a couple of them you could have a nice little kind of uh, side army good to go and ready to go as well at the same time um, one other thing I want to show you is the the goblins with the um, the fanatics with the little kind of ball and chain that these were very creative there was some great fun with these models here that the sense of sheer variety all they're doing is just tossing a ball and chain around and they're killing anyone and everything with them but there was so much variety in these models that you know you could tell that the sculptors had fun making it and thinking it and designing it because the whole thing was just absolute fun with it um, and it's not just goblins. I need to have a look as well at some of the Sylvanath. Um, this one I was quite happy with because um, I got to work again with contrast paints. And Gilliman Blue, unfortunately, which seems to be paint that you can't get anymore, was the one that kind of gave this the effect that I wanted. But the Sylvanath, again, was a faction I never would have collected. But uh, now that I have some of them, I'm quite happy with them. Um, there's enough in this that you nearly have a spearhead for the new Warhammer game, so if you do have the entire collection, the, you do have a good chance to try the Sylvanath out for yourself. Um, there is also the Dwarves, which I had a special affinity for being uh, kind of short, fat, angry men. That uh, There was a nice steampunk kind of aspect to them that uh, they turned literally the concept of dwarf off and up on its head because these guys are literally in the sky rather than kind of in the mines and in the ground but they were still industrious and doing their whole thing. Um, 
Again, very steampunk, which was an unusual aesthetic to be able to squeeze in here, but nevertheless, uh, they managed it. And uh, I think it's uh, certainly a very fun army that if I was going to expand on this beyond, say, my Stormcast Eternals, that <clears throat> it might be the Sky Dwarfs that I would choose to kind of uh, elaborate and increase on because I just love their little airships and I love the whole kind of the <laughs> privateers uh, kind of corporate protection um, union thing that, that they all kind of do and have together so that um, there's a real kind of buccaneers vibe to them. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, this is another model that I had fun painting. This came out quite early in the collection and um, it's funny it's not the most effective model that you would think you do have nice variants that you would have an axe or a sword here or a range aspect these two models can actually kind of bite and claw and do their own thing as well but it's not as fast as you would have hoped I often tried my first few games to flank with this model and then try and circle around the middle but all it really did was just kind of um, distract my opponent's flankers and uh, it ended up just being kind of a side battle uh, rather than kind of anything elaborate. It was never powerful enough to kind of one-shot a unit so it would just kind of get caught. So if anything I think that this mobile is best as a mobile reserve uh, rather than kind of um, a storming kind of uh, model because despite its actual look because it's um, <laughs> I don't know, it just, it's not as fast as you would like or as hope, but still a very impressive model, very kind of gladiator, especially with this kind of um, headpiece, <coughs> excuse me, on the main rider. But uh, nevertheless, one of the models I really like in this collection. Um, one other little one I will show is this. It was part of, um, again, the Underworlds collection, but I just really liked it. It's just a little bird that was part of um, a faction that it's um, it was part of the Shadespire Underworlds game but just a really cool little bird that was nice to kind of build and paint and put together really quickly it's nice when you get a model that gives you really good results really quickly and this was one of the results that did it and I also spy here the first two models that I painted and again whenever you do a hashtag collection <coughs> it's nearly always worth buying the first issue twice because this <coughs> excuse me this was my first attempt at the Oruks and this was my subsequent attempt <coughs> excuse me I had to have a bit of a coughing fit there but this was my subsequent attempt so you can see that this was the color scheme I, opt I eventually opted to go with but uh, nevertheless a lovely model and I was very lucky to be able to have it twice but if you do collect any collections like this in the future it is always worth getting the first issue a couple of times so you can kind of experiment with your paints and see what you can do because this was still more standard paint fair and this was my first time kind of working with uh, contrasts which did not come out as well as I would have hoped so that ladies and gentlemen is pretty much the entire collection it has been a journey um, I'm happy to see it and I'm continuing to play with it and I'm continuing to collect Age of Sigmar. Um, it's a fun game, it's something that I would not be playing if it wasn't for this magazine and uh, I have to say it's every bit as fun as Warhammer 40k. The lore obviously is not quite as uh, dense or as elaborate or as packed but nevertheless there is a lot of potential here with this game and I I have to be honest, I find this much more fun to paint because there's a lot more creativity to it. So with that, all I can say is thank you for sharing this journey with me, watching this journey with me. And uh, as always, this is Sean from The Lucky Roll. If you enjoy these videos, please like, subscribe, all that good YouTube stuff. And until next time, good luck. And this is Sean signing off. <laughs>